with, with us, mm -hmm. our day, we especially. And thank you, Nikos. Thank you, State Museum, for hosting us. This is a really special platform, I think. Incredibly uh, open and inspiring to work with him. So I hope we do it justice today. Um, we were invited to unpack this idea of fabulation um, in the sense of fabrication, fabricating the real. I feel an echo. And I have a problem with the imaginary, which is probably a bit strange for the line of work I'm in, but um, I don't like fantasy. I also don't watch animation. I feel like I'm in the, like, uh, a point that I need to share things with you and take a deep breath. But okay, so I've said it. But it's probably because I have a very conservative idea of fabulations and fantasy. And um, it could also be that I regard it too highly because I think my knee-jerk anti-fabulation idea is because I always think that reality is so full of uh, problems, uh, inconsistencies, traumas, uh, opacities, that why would we need to add anything to that? Why would we need to exaggerate in any sense? Because it's difficult enough just to come to grips with this right in front of me. Um, but bear with me. I'm not going to tear it all down. I'm hopefully going to build it up in somehow, in some way. Uh, I'd like to offer you three cases. Three cases that maybe circle this idea of fabulation, or maybe look at um, um, radically discontinuous practices, or maybe radically continuous practices. And maybe there's no difference, but that's up to you to decide. The first involves Um, two artists. I'm sorry, they're all going to be from the 70s. I will warn you now. Chris D'Arcangelo and Peter Naden. Through some of the Kunst I worked with, Ben Kimont, I was introduced to them um, because, because they did something that I'm still trying to figure out. They both seriously explored the presence and non-presence value and non-value. So what they did also in order to make money, they would uh, do construction, renovation work in people's houses. And not just anyone. I mean, at the time, uh, Chris D'Arcangelo was working for Louise Lawler, a very famous artist. He was also doing work for um, uh, Daniel Duren. So they were quite well informed. And what they would do is that they would go, they would be hired, they would paint walls, they would construct ceilings, etc., etc., and then they would step back and they would send out these invitations. And people would be invited to the opening of their renovation. Um, I forgot to do one little quote by, um, by Chris D'Arcangelo. Chris D'Arcangelo also considers himself an anarchist. And um, he once wrote, when I state that I'm an anarchist, I must also state that I'm not an anarchist, to be in keeping with the, and then in parentheses, dot, 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 idea of anarchism, and anarchism he wrote upside down. So this as a way of saying, I want to talk about something that I simply cannot talk about. And these renovations fall in that kind of category, I think, of present, non-present, trying to talk about something that's there and maybe not there at the same time. But in short, for a period in the late 70s, they, would, they, did these, uh, they did these renovations. They invited people to come talk about them. Later, in 1996, Chris D'Arcangelo had already committed suicide, unfortunately. Uh, Peter Nagin said probably they were the only ones who were interested in whether or not these renovations were conceptual sculptures or not. But still, they were important for them. Um, don't forget, this was also at the same time <clears throat> that uh, People like Dan Flavin were going to the hardware store to buy fluorescent lights in order to make their sculptures, right? And Robert Ryan was painting his uh, canvases white on white. So this is all part of a similar conversation. They also opened a gallery for a year only. Um, 
But the interesting thing is that Chris D'Arcangelo, though he was invited to be in shows, he never actually showed work, so he would remove himself. And that, that happened in, in various degrees of radicality. One would be to leave a blank, so it would be an artist list and there would be a blank, and another way would be to remove himself entirely and invite other people to, to show in his stead. In fact, just as he was, well, I was going to say dying, but the, so around the time of his death, he had been invited or convinced Rudy Fuchs, who was then director of the Van Alba Museum, to remove all of the works, all of the curated works in the, in the museum and replace them with works by, um, not works, sorry, with things that uh, everyone in Eindhoven wanted to have in their museum. And apparently it was happening, but it never came to fruition. Um, case number two. <coughs> Case number two, on three Wednesday evenings in March, coincidentally, in 1970 though, Hannah Wiener and her boss, Simeon Schreiber of Schreiber and Company Incorporated were available at her studio on 10 West 33rd Street, New York City, where they sold bikini underpants at their usual price, prices of 49 cents and $1. <coughs> One item was made especially for this show by August Fabrics and A. Schreiber himself, and this work was titled, Hannah Wiener at Her Job. <coughs> Hannah Wiener was a poet, but she also worked as a part-time designer of ladies' underwear. She liked her job and the firm she worked for, and according to Wiener, they made and sold products without unnecessary competition. And this is great. She felt that if things couldn't be free, then they should be as cheap as possible. Because why waste one's time on producing expensive products that one then needs to waste more time on trying to acquire? As a poet, and as an important part of the language movement in the 70s and 80s, she recorded everything, even and maybe especially minute date details of everyday life. Developing her own style, she, can you read that? Yeah. Um, a style she called Claire style, C-L-A-I-R. Some of her works were signed clairvoyantly written Hannah Wiener. She saw words in things and on people's foreheads in a wide variety of sizes, script and printed on her own forehead and on other people and on every imaginable surface or non-surface. She explained, and this is where this is coming from, it turned out that the regular, regular upper and lowercase words described what I was doing, the capitals gave me orders, and the underlines or the italics made comments. This is not 100% true, but mostly so, she said. The words started to appear in August 72. Before that, she'd only been receiving messages through feeling, energy, and later pictures developed and, and, uh, and colors. Wiener was interested in trans-space communication, and according to her, there are three obligations a poet has, or one has, you could say. To work on oneself, take a deep breath, to work to change the world, and three, to work on poetic forms, in her case. Case number three. Oh yeah, this is difficult. Ram L.T. Ram L.T. said, the letter is armed to stop all the phony formations, lies, and trick knowledges placed upon its structure. Ram L.T. died in 2010. He was a graffiti writer, musician, and see an author of, take a deep breath, iconic treaties, gothic futurism, assassin knowledges of the re-manipulated square points one to 720 degrees to 1440 degrees a treatise that is so crowded, so difficult to read, so dense, that it becomes like a performance to read it. His career began with tagging the A-Train in New York, A probably for a good reason, 
as, in a style known then as East Village Wild Style, with the script contain, originating from Gothic or medieval manuscript because he believes that he was uh, like a lexical commander in chief that got his directions directly from the monks from the 14th century because it was them in a period where there were very few people who could read and write. They were the ones who were funneling the energies and the power of these letters, these single letters. They would decorate them. They would go so far in decorating them that their bosses, the popes and the bishops, wouldn't even understand what was being written anymore. So they were the ones holding all the power. He saw himself as a direct, um, <coughs> yes, exactly, you understand what I'm saying. Um, he called himself a Gothic futurist, and he believed his work to point towards iconoclast panzerism, a world in which Roman letters would liberate themselves from <coughs> European power structures and eventually go to battle. For example, and this is a quote, A, capital, energy, hauser, constructor, finance, formation, high bar strategy, middle lane missile launcher, Uppercase falls once, second case, second case, second lane missile launcher falls twice, third lane vortex complete, all lanes hold complete. B. First lane readmission, third lane readmission, second lane curved, connected to first and third lanes, fourth lane representing Ibele, undividing E, concentric three, knowledge of the B, formation ground separation. Third lane starting first fold from the bottom, B the formation R, first stage capital position, this lane capital, long lane missile launcher, second lane equalizer for the first lane, A and B. Both Hannah Wiener and Ramon C used language words and even letters, obviously in their very own way and very specifically, but is this mythic, is it fantasy, is it sci-fi, is it fabulation? Uh, Ramelty liberated letters from their enslaved status in the alphabet so that they could go to battle. Wiener saw words on people's foreheads. She saw instructions on everything that she encountered. And you might be able to, depending on where you decide to stand, to term all of these three cases fabulations. Um, they all deal with the parameters or the institutions that we know language, labor, administrative institutions, but they subvert them or they intrude upon them. They use them, much like our guests today. Today, instead of speaking to you, most of the guests will be sharing <coughs> things with you, letting you figure out where you want to stand, how you want to move, how much space you want to take up, and where you draw the line, if any, between fabulation and what we call reality. So take this day, take a deep breath, allow it to fall, sweep over you, allow yourself to be led through the day. Uh, I will be introducing each guest as they come on, so not everyone right now. Now I only want to introduce our very first guest. I'm incredibly honored that Rosalind Meshashibi is here. Who little does she know it? Uh, restored my faith in the exhibition model just recently in September when I went to see her uh, her exhibition at the event, which included her most recent film, which is called Part One, Where There Is a Joyous Mood, There a Comrade Will Appear to Share a Glass of Wine. Uh, Rosalind Nashashibi is a London-based artist. She makes films and paintings. She received her BA um, at Sheffield, uh, Hallam University, and after that, she went to the Glasgow School of Art for her MFA. She represented Scotland in the 52nd Venice <coughs> Annual. Her work was included in Documenta 14, Foxall Gallery Foundation, the Art Institute of Shack, Chicago, Murray Guy, the Imperial War Museum, Objectif in Antwerpen, ICA London, Centre Pompidou, Kunstwerk in Munich, Sculpture Centre New York, and Whitechapel London. And I'm probably missing a few. Um, there's a show right now with Grimm Gallery, no, in New York, ah, also, but it's not here, it's there. Um, and later this year, she will debut a new film in a solo show at the Vienna, Se uh, Vienna Secession and the Edinburgh Arts Festival. 
She's a senior lecturer as well at the Fine Art of Fine Art at Goldsmith University. Thank you for being here, Wasn't. Thank you, everyone, and I leave the stage to you.